Good morning, good morning, Evergreen Church. Welcome. Man, it is one of those days, huh? Everybody's dragging this morning. Uh, we're glad that y'all are joining us in worship. We're glad that y'all are joining us in virtual space. My name is Jonathan Goolsby. I am our director of youth. On behalf of the rest of the church, welcome uh, to worship with us this morning. A couple announcements as we get started. Uh, I want to say a thank you uh, to our congregation and members for uh, just donating valentines and cards and treats and other things for our elderly as well as our Thrive Kids and our college students uh, a couple weeks ago. We just wanted to make sure that we uh, got to send uh, this group a little bit of extra love uh, since we haven't been able to see them much lately. Um, also, thank you to all the volunteers who help assemble those things and get those together uh, for that Valentine's Day surprise. And so thank you. Also today, we have a Thrive Picnic immediately following this service. And so um, that is over at Picnic Park, which is, which is beside Drake Field just down the way. That is at 1 o'clock. And so you can bring a sack lunch, a blanket, whatever, come out, hang out with each other, and uh, maybe kick a ball around with the kids. And so we'll be out there today from 1 till about 2.30. And so we'd love to see you. If you have kids, you come on, join us. If you don't and you just want to hang out with us anyways, you're welcome to do that as well. And so hopefully see you out at Picnic Park at one o'clock today. Don, you have something for us this morning? I do. I, do. I, have, a, I have a question um, for you. Oh. Well, I have a question for you is, what do you call an airplane flying backwards? A receding airline. <laughs> <laughs> Too close to home. Save that one. You'll need it. Yeah. You'll need it. Uh, there are many other announcements and info with, on our church website as well as in our newsletter. If you, get, if you don't get our newsletter in your email, let us know. We'd love to add you to that list so you can get that. Um, I think that is all the announcements I have. Uh, let's continue with our call to worship. Uh, today it comes from Isaiah 35. As we start our journey into Lent, let's keep our eyes focused on the life God promises when he promises, when his promises are all fulfilled. What has been desert will become a garden. What was empty will be filled. And those who could not see, speak, or walk will celebrate in joy. The words of Isaiah point us in the direction of the incredible change that the coming of the Lord will bring. I'll begin by saying, the desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. As we move deeper into worship in music and song this morning, let us focus on and claim the goodness of God towards us and the world. Will you all stand with us? Well, I'm sitting, but you stand. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail, and there I find you in the mystery, in ocean's deep, my faith
Please be seated. Isaiah 59 says that sin acts as a barrier between us and God. It isn't that God doesn't speak or that we can't hear him. It's that our sin gets in the way. Yet even in our sin, God promises he will redeem us. Knowing how far we have fallen and how much we need the forgiveness of God, let's go to the Lord and confess our sins together. Mighty God, for all the ways in which our lives do not reflect your glory, we raise our spirits and confess. For our acts of pettiness, self-righteousness, our greed, and our judgment, we confess. For the opportunities to love, to be generous, to extend kindness, which we have passed by, we confess. We confess in hope of forgiveness. We confess in hope of love. We confess in hope of your faithfulness and truth in your grace. Transform us from what we have been and fulfill us in your vision for a redeemed humanity. Hear us now as we open our hearts to you in silent confession.
In the name of our risen Christ, we pray. Amen. Now comes the good part, the part where we claim the gift of Christ. Because of God's sacrifice in Jesus, we, are, we have been made new. Join me in the assurance of pardon based out of Romans 8. I'll start. Hear the good news. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is it in position to condemn? Only Christ Jesus, who died and who more than that has been raised to life. He is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Friends, believe the good news in Jesus Christ. Our sins have been forgiven. Amen. Will you please stand?
thank you for worshiping.
stand together and thank our worship team. You all may be seated. I can't really think of a song that would be better for this new series that we're starting this morning. The series um, is going to be our Lenten series. will carry us through the 40 days between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday. And I mean, it may just be me, but with all the confusion of life, COVID, the elections, the continuing problems around racial injustice, somehow in Lent, I think I'm just hungry for less. There's so much going on in the world that just for a time, I want to back up and get back to the basics. One of the basics of the Christian faith is the question that Jesus poses to his followers in Matthew chapter 16. And he asks them, who do you say that I am? In that chapter and before, people who encounter Jesus seem to be puzzled by him, whether you point the, to the disciples who were baffled and confused by him, the religious leaders who keep asking for signs from heaven, everyone keeps asking the same question, who is this that I'm encountering? In Matthew 16, Jesus and his disciples are in the region of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is north of Jerusalem by about 100 miles. It's located on a terrace that overlooks this beautiful valley. It's a city well known for its worship of the Canaanite god Baal. Um, if you've read the Old Testament, you'll recognize that name. And it's a god that, that the Israelites, for some reason, kept chasing after. But in this region, there is also a, well, it's the home to the Greek god Pan. It's the source of the Jordan River, a river that's almost holy to the Jewish people. And there's also a white marble temple dedicated to the worship of the Roman emperor in this area. And so it's no accident that Jesus asks his disciples this, this foundational question here in this place. Here in the middle of all these different religious claims, ancient and modern, from the gods of, of the Syrians to the gods of the Greeks to the gods of the Romans, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, yes, but who do you say that I am? Every follower of Jesus, at some point in their spiritual journey, must answer this question. Sometimes we answer it multiple times. And though the background that we stand in is a bit different than the region of Caesarea Philippi, we still answer that question in the middle of many competing claims. The world is full of claims on our lives, on our hearts, and our spirits. But once we answer the question, we also have to examine the way that we are living because we want to make sure that the way we live and the way we love lines up with our answer. And Lent is a great time to reconsider or even consider for the first time how we answer this question and whether we're living and loving according to the answer. Now, I'm pretty sure that some of you, when I asked the question that Jesus asked, who do you say that I am, I'm pretty sure some of you probably had some kind of answer to it. Most, if not all of us, do have some kind of answer to that question. I think that if you walked down any busy street in America and you stopped 10 people and asked them that question, I suspect you would get some kind of answer. Uh, you might get something about the Son of God. You might get something about the Savior of the world. You might get someone who said Jesus was a good teacher. Some people would speak in terms of what they believe. Others would speak in terms of what Jesus claimed. But most most people would be talking in terms of the characteristics of Jesus, but they'd all have some idea, probably, of who Jesus is. But knowing how to describe someone is vastly different than knowing them. There's a very big difference than, than being able to list characteristics of someone. You know, she's 5'2 and has brown hair. He's six, four, and, and plays hockey. I mean, there's a very big difference between listing characteristics and actually knowing someone's heart. Over the next several weeks, we're going to take a look at people who encounter Jesus, people who come to know him, and the idea is to let these people introduce us to Jesus all over again, to learn from them, to listen to them as, as they answer this question, who do you say that I am? all of which may help us answer the question to us. 
This morning we're going to begin our reintroduction to Jesus through the eyes of a man who introduces Jesus to the world. He is the herald of Jesus. His ministry introduces all four Gospels, and his name is John, better known as John the Baptist. And according to Luke, John, uh, Jesus, well, according to Luke, um, John is the son of Jesus' mother's, uh, Mary's relative, Elizabeth. And his birth, like Jesus', is foretold by an angel. John's father, Zechariah, is a priest in the division of Abijah, which is a, an ancient division of priests that was actually established by Moses' brother, Aaron. John's mother traces her family roots back to Aaron as well. And so the lineage and parentage of John is, is very connected back to Aaron, who is the first priest of the nation of Israel. All the Gospels see John as the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah's pronouncement that before the coming of the Messiah, that there would be one who would come to announce his arrival. Matthew, Mark, and the Gospel of John all connect John the Baptist with Isaiah's words. They say that John is the voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. In Luke, John's father Zechariah has this to say about his son. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Can you imagine saying that to your infant son. And so John himself is intertwined with the coming of the Messiah. He is no stranger to the scriptures or the prophecies about the one who's to come. John is out in the wilderness preaching a baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and he's calling people to repentance in the face of this coming Messiah. He believes, based on the scriptures and the prophets, that, that the day of the Lord is coming, the day that God will judge the earth. And he believes that it is close at hand, this day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. John believes that the day of judgment aligns itself with the coming of the Messiah. And John is not shy when people come out to hear him. He's not shy about what he has to say to them. And he's not afraid to speak to power either. Both Mark and Luke record John winding up in prison for speaking against the king, against Herod, because he has married his brother's wife. And John says, you shouldn't do that. It, John, in other words, is, is preaching, well, I'll use the word physical ethics, but you get the idea. And he eventually ends up beheaded for this. But I am getting a little in front of myself. All the Gospels clearly show us a John that is confident the Messiah is coming into the world. What is not clear is John's confidence that this Messiah is Jesus. Hang on to that for a second because you'll see that, well, you'll see. The Gospel accounts sort of differ on this point, but do they is really my question. It's clear that the Gospel of John, for example, in John, at the very beginning, John the Baptist understands and proclaims Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I mean, it couldn't be much clearer than that. He sees Jesus as, as God's chosen one. The Gospel of Matthew, however, presents things well, in a little bit of a different light. In our reading for this morning, John is in prison because Herod doesn't like to be criticized. And so John's followers visit him in prison, and John sets before them a task to complete, a question to ask. I'm in the Gospel of Matthew in the 11th chapter, beginning in verse 2. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah... He sent, this, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. 
at first you see how this, this portrayal of John in Matthew seems a little inconsistent with the portrayal of John in, in the Gospel of John. Because here in Matthew, it almost seems like John has this, this, this fleeting doubt. There there's, seems like there's some inconsistency, but, but I have to tell you that I think that the difference here is well, I think the inconsistency has, to, is, has more to do with location than it does conviction. I mean, have you ever been very, very convinced about something when you're standing here and then three hours later you find yourself over here and you're not quite as convinced as you were when you were standing over here earlier? Well, in the Gospel of John, when, Jesus, when um, John makes this, this claim about Jesus being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he's free. He's standing in the sun. His disciples are, are around him. Jesus is in his presence. In Matthew, he is shackled. He is sitting in prison. He is in the dark, locked up, under threat for speaking against the moral life of the king. Now, I don't think that a shift in location should necessarily equal a shift in conviction, but I can see how a shift in location might necessitate a need for somebody to reassure me of what I've always believed. Sometimes when life shifts, you need to reestablish your conviction. And that's the way I read this. I don't think this is about doubt. I think this is about reassurance. Are you the one who is to come or not? What's really fascinating, though, here is how Jesus answers John. Jesus doesn't say, yes, John, I am the Messiah. He doesn't make claims of authority. He doesn't just use words. And maybe that would have been enough for John, but think about this. If you were in a prison cell somewhere, and you asked this question, and someone just from their own authority gave you that answer, would it not wear a little bit after a time? Wouldn't you start thinking, well, that's what he says. Instead, Jesus says to John's disciples, tell him what you see and what you hear. Tell him the blind regain their sight, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, good news is proclaimed to the poor. The reason that I I find this just fascinating. I mean, Jesus says essentially, John, you need to decide for yourself And don't decide whether I'm the one for whom you have waited. Don't decide that based upon the words that are swirling around me. Base it upon what I'm doing. And secondly, and I think this is huge, Jesus' answer sends John back to an unwavering answer. It sends him back to the Scriptures, something that John knows very well. It sends John back to the prophets. John believes this text. And so Jesus points him back to this answer, which will never change. He, changed, he points him back to the Word of God. In fact, in chapter 35 of Isaiah, which we used as a call to worship this morning, it says, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, he will come to save you. That is very good news if you are sitting in a cell somewhere. But it goes on, it says, then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, then the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. What is it that people are experiencing? Exactly this, water will gush forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert, and from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from the darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. For John, there is no better answer to his question. Are you the one who is to come? I mean, people can have all kinds of opinions about who Jesus is, but his actions actually leave very little room for doubt. Jesus' answer to John cements John's conviction once again, even though he's living in a crummy location. 
And I think this is incredibly helpful when we try to answer the question ourselves, who do you say that I am? Too often, people come at faith as if it's a one-time, never-wavering, straight-line kind of proposition. I mean, most of the time, no one wants to admit the ups and downs of faith, the twists and turns of faith, because somewhere, maybe when we were this big, but maybe even as an adult, we were, we were told that we were never, ever to have any doubts that it was always just supposed to run straight like this, and if you run up against anything, you just need to tough it out. But faith isn't like that. Faith has its ups and downs, its in and outs, its twists and turns, because faith is alive. And here is the thing. If faith is going to grow, it is going to need to be challenged every once in a while. You cannot grow your body You cannot become stronger without challenging it. You cannot grow your mind without challenging it. Faith is no different. And sometimes when your locations change in life, you need to be reassured of what you've believed. You need a confirmation of of what you have always carried with you, or even if it's new to you. Even John the Baptist, I mean, look, this is a guy who knew Jesus intimately. He baptized Jesus. He saw the dove light on Jesus. And even then, when life got hard, John needed to be reassured, are you the one who is to come? And I want you to notice something. Jesus does not beat John up for the question. I mean, seriously, John, you're going to ask this question now after everything that we've been through? Jesus doesn't do that. He simply provides for John in love. And so if you're new to Jesus or you're new to answering this kind of question for yourself, if you're being moved by the Spirit into a faith that's, that's more authentic, that's fine. If you've got questions, it's fine because you know what? John the Baptist did too. And I think if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for you. Secondly, as you try to answer this incredibly profound question. I mean, who do you say that I am? I think we take Jesus up on his suggestion to John. Instead of simply expecting an answer which describes Jesus in doctrinal terms, and believe me, I can give you an answer about who Jesus is in doctrinal terms. What if we focus on his actions instead? What if we go back into the Gospels and actually look at what Jesus did? What did his ministry look like among the disciples? What does that tell you about who he is? What is the message that his actions are communicating? What is important to him? And then, and then look at what Jesus is still doing in the world today. Because still today, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and good news is preached to the poor in the name of Jesus by and through those who are fueled by the Holy Spirit and who are followers of Jesus. I mean, think about this. Think about schools for the poor who are educating kids who would never have a chance to read. Think about our mission partner, God's Eyes, who travels around the world and makes the gift of eyeglasses to people who literally cannot see. Think about specialized schools started by by parents because Jesus was deep in their souls and they thought there's got to be a better thing for this kid, my kid, and other kids as well. Faith in Jesus is what has spurred people to passion about the poor, the sick, those with bad eyesight, those who cannot walk. And so much good in this world, hospitals, universities, schools, you name it, has Jesus at its roots. Now, we've forgotten that many times. It's been taken out of the mission statement many times. But you look back, and it's there. It is faith that opens food pantries. It's faith that opens hospitals. It's faith that, that helps organize specialized schools. It is the Spirit of God at work in and through the faithful, which allows these incredible acts of selflessness to spread the love and knowledge of God around the world. It is no accident that the name and Spirit of Jesus still echo in these things 2,000 years later. 
Every culture and every power that sought to oppose him during his lifetime has turned to dust. And yet his name is still praised. His name is still exalted. His call to heal, to love, to provide. This is irrefutable truth that his work continues. And it shows us that John was right. He was right in his conclusions that indeed this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Karl Barth was an an early 20th century Protestant theologian, and he kept a a copy of this painting um, by uh, Matthias Grunewald over his writing desk. Um, This painting, well, Grunewald uh, was born about 1475. He was a contemporary of Martin Luther. Not much of his work survives. Um, This is one of the few paintings. Uh, This was actually part of the Isenheim altarpiece, but um, it wasn't commissioned for a church. It was commissioned for a hospital, a hospital that treated a specific disease called St. Anthony's Fire. In this painting, you can see over here on the left-hand side, that's Mary uh, Mary Magdalene is down on her knees there at the foot of the cross, and that's Mary, the mother of Jesus, along with the apostle John over here on the left. And then this man on the other side holding the book with the enormously long finger pointing at Jesus is John the Baptist. Bart said that this painting helped him as a theologian because he always needed to remember that everything in the scriptures points to Jesus, just as John knew that everything points to Jesus. This is a visual statement about of what the scriptures say, that he is the one who was expected. He is the one for whom John waited. He is the one that we have waited for. 2,000 years later, John the Baptist still heralds the coming of Jesus. He still points us in the direction of Jesus. And John makes sure that when we face the question he asks, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another, that we can answer it with confidence. And the impact of that answer, the answer to that question is something that as people of faith, we spend the rest of our lives exploring, refining, revisiting. Let's pray together. Father, you you know, you know how weak we are as your children, you know how easily distracted we become. It's like whatever the next shiny thing is, we always tend to run off towards it until sometimes when life shifts and our location changes. And so, Lord, whether we are in a good place, a hard place, or somewhere in between this morning, Lord, we ask that by your Spirit, we would allow your Word to point us back in the direction of Jesus. And that we would find within ourselves the the ability to answer the question, are you the one who was to come? That we can answer that question with with a confident yes. That we can understand that that it's okay for us to have questions and to sometimes wonder and need reassurance because, because in your love, you're more than willing to provide it. So Lord, pour your spirit out upon us. Whether we're here in this place or we're um, sitting on our couch at home. And remind us and reassure us and give us strength in our spirits and in our souls of the reality of of who Jesus is. Remind us, Lord, that, that Jesus said he would never leave us, that he was with us always to the end of the age. Let's begin to claim that, especially in these days as we're, we're leading up to the resurrection, we're leading up to the crucifixion. Let's find our home in you once again, O God.
leaving behind every other claim the world has on us. Every religion, every, well, all of it, Father. We just want to leave it at the foot of the cross and, and claim the supremacy of Jesus. Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders, wherever they may be, whatever level they may be on, whether they are our mayor, uh, whether they are state representatives, whether they are at the federal level. We pray for leaders across the world as they, as they continue to try to deal with um, this health situation with COVID. Father, we ask that, that even for those who do not know you, who pers- profess no knowledge of you, that your spirit would still be in them, that you would still guide their decisions, and that your world would be reconciled back to you. We believe in the power of Jesus. We believe that that there is more to come. We believe that Jesus will come again. And so, God, help us find hope in that, confidence in that. We love you. You've shown us that you love us. Now, Lord, you show us how to live it out. We offer this to you in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Let's stand together and worship.
think there's um, I don't think there's a better proclamation of God's faithfulness to you where it started and where it will end a thousand generations to your children and their children and their children after them and on and on and on only because God is faithful and he loves you so go out and live that out every day. It's easy to live out of fear. It's easy to live out of lots of other things, but live out of that. Love your neighbors. Serve the Lord. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and in you, both now and forever. Amen.